we are all familiar with the phrase space the final frontier but the word frontier also has a complex and problematic past associated with colonialism in this episode of chai on the moon we talk with dr mary jane rubenstein professor of religion and science in society at wesleyan university and the author of more recently astrotopia the dangerous religion of the corporate space race our guest today is uh, professor mary jane rubenstein and uh, she's a professor of religion and science in society at wesleyan university and is affiliated with the philosophy department and the feminist gender, gender and sexuality studies program her research unearths the philosophies and histories of religion and science especially in relationship to cosmology ecology and space travel we'll come back to it in a second so she's the author of several books including pantheologies god world's monsters worlds without end the many lives of the multiverse which some of you will also be interested in uh, and strange wonder the closure of metaphysics and the opening of all which also will be some of you will be interested in so basically you have most of her books you all be interested in but more relevant for us she has a wonderful uh, book that came out just this past year astrotopia here it is astrotopia the dangerous religion of the corporate space race and so this is something uh, that we want to talk about so uh, please uh, professor rubenstein welcome thank you so much it's really wonderful to be here salman thank you thank you so it's a tricky topic because many of us are space enthusiasts including myself uh, and in fact i remember and so I, this was in my undergraduate days um, i would go and i was at stony brook uh, in new york and uh, we didn't have a tv in the dorm room so i would have to go all the way to the student union and there was one small tv at that time no computers and stuff and watch star trek the next generation and it would start with space the final frontier and i remember and in fact i miss it because they later on especially the newer versions of star trek don't start with that sort of like narration uh but it gave me then and it still gives me now goosebumps like you know when i hear space the final frontier right i like, you know and uh and it gave me sense of sort of like you know wonder curiosity exploration and with that sound of sort of like you know evocative uh like you know I mean, yeah it was just amazing now i know that you devoted a chapter on the issue of the use of the word frontier and especially with related to space as well how do you see that what i mean i know you take up you see this a bit problematic why is that okay so this this is also tricky because i like you love space i think space is amazing it's beautiful it is the um you know i think the place of our most fervent imaginings and um for for some of us you know our 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 most um like our deepest sense of wonder and amazement and things like that. Um, so I share with you that that sense, that sort of feeling that wells up when you think about, you know, heading to space or going to space or thinking about space or looking at space or kind of meditating on space. Um, the frontier language uh, is, I, and and I, you know, I, I hate to be that academic who um, makes every get, has bad news for everybody. You know, <laughs> it's like, oh, this thing that you really love turns out has this really terrible history. Um, but here's the history, and then we can decide whether or not we like the term. Um, the history, um, this this idea of um, the final frontier, um, the farthest I can trace it back is um, uh, to the 19th century when the then governor of California um, during the gold rush referred to California as the last frontier because um, California was as far as particularly European descended Americans could make it across the continent um, before they got to the Pacific Ocean. So California was the last frontier. It was the place that that we could, you know, that after which there was there was nothing more um, and there was gold and there were fortunes 
to be made and there was land to be had. Um, this land, of course, as we know, belonged to other people, um, but the US government was giving it away for uh, a very little uh, amount of money um, to primarily white um, settlers who would move and you know, domesticate uh, the, the, the continent. Um, fast forward to the 1950s, um, early 19, about 1953, um, the former Nazi rocket scientist Werner von Braun, who had been brought over to the U.S. through a then secret CIA operation, it was known as Operation Paperclip, the U.S. basically captured thousands of Nazi rocket scientists and brought them to the U.S. and in exchange for amnesty, right, we will not prosecute you for having destroyed all these humans. Um, in exchange for amnesty, uh, they uh, pledged their lives to helping the U.S. government develop rockets of its own. Werner von Braun was the most uh, famous of these. He had developed the V-2 rocket in Germany. Um, he, in 1953, uh, declared that uh, the, the whole the notion of manifest destiny that had moved, again, sort of European descended Americans across the whole continent was being reopened. And there was a new frontier. And California was no longer the last frontier. Now the last frontier is outer space. And the good news is that it's an infinite frontier because it doesn't end in the Pacific Ocean or any ocean anywhere at all. Um, so, uh, so this is the idea that the same... Um, and this is where I start getting judgy about it, the same imperialism uh, that conquered the North American con uh, continent is now being extended into outer space. And it's now America's manifest destiny to go sort of vertically up um, and, and conquer conquer the spaceways. So that's that's the that's the background. So, so if I so, so there are a couple of things uh, if you can and and uh, and um, Werner von Braun, I mean, like, you know, he's known as the father of modern rocketry. And I think, and I'm, I'm going to ask him, uh, there's a fascinating story in your book about him and Disney, which I want to uh, come back to it uh, in a second. But can you connect sort of like the use of the word manifest destiny? And you said, so did Werner von Braun use it? And, and uh, if I remember correctly, more recently, I think uh, Mike Pence and Donald Trump both used it or one of them used it. How does that, I mean, is the use of the word more sort of like, you know, rhetorical or do you see a deeper uh, connection to the colonial context, uh, which yeah. the way it was used earlier on? Uh, I, I absolutely see a deeper connection to the colonial context, um, whether or not it's ever been sincere, whether or not any of these politicians has ever believed that God was at actually endorsing this kind of conquest who knows uh, but but I, I certainly see it as a direct inheritance yeah the idea of manifest destiny um, really took hold in the 19th century um, it was an extension of the older idea of the doctrine of discovery um, which assured European nations that whichever um, whoever found new lands first whichever European nation found new lands first um, if they found those lands to be uh, uninhabited and then it turns out none of the lands were uninhabited but undeveloped developed, so like the, the native folks hadn't seemed, seemed not to have done anything with the land, uh, then it would then belong to Europe. That was the doctrine of discovery. It would belong to whichever European nation had found it first. Um, the extension in the 19th century uh, um, uh, comes by means of this doctrine of manifest destiny. Basically, the idea is that um, God has chosen um, this new nation, the United States, as God's new Israel. That just as God had made a covenant with the ancient Israelites and had said to them, um, "I'm going to give you a land of your own that you know I, that <laughs> where there are already people living, but it's now going to be your land because I want it to be your land and I'm God." Um, God was saying the same thing to the people of the the, the, the white folks of of North. America. This land is your land. I, God, have given it to you. Um, it is your destiny to take over this entire continent. And that destiny, this is what's so interesting about this phrase, unlike the destiny of the Jews, which is like, I don't know, whoever knows that God is on the side of the Jews. The Jews are always like having a hard time historically, right? So that that, that destiny is kind of murky. Um, the destiny of Americans is manifest because America is winning so hard, right? So it's mm -hmm. it's a clear destiny. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, you know, God's covenant is even stronger with Americans than it had been with the people of the book. Um, it is now ma America's manifest destiny to um, take this entire uh, continent. And yes, uh, Werner von Braun then said, now, you know, manifest destiny is being extended into outer space. And as recently as 2020, 
Donald Trump said that America's manifest destiny was in the heavens. Um, Mike Pence also quoted some psalms to assure America that God was going to be on the side of any any American enterprise that tried to to conquer outer space. Um, so I do see it as a as a totally direct inheritance. Um, it's not clear to me that the idea of manifest destiny, the idea of God's choosing a nation to conquer more land is as rhetorically powerful as it used to be, um, even in the 19th century. I don't think it's as rhetorically powerful. I think there are other more powerful rhetoricians out there who are, you know, frankly, the um, private space actors, um, the big space CEOs. They've got a, a more compelling religious rhetoric than that of Manifest Destiny, but it, it's certainly it's certainly the same rhetoric. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Because, uh, I mean, in some sense, uh, and... I don't know how the Soviets looked at it. Like, you know, for example, within that context, I mean, that they also saw it as the war of ideas uh, in that sense. And you don't need from the American side, although uh, God and religion did play a role, a big role within in the Cold War, earlier Cold War as well. But I mean, the nationalism, I mean, that can replace God, I mean, in some sense, and people do talk about, uh, of course, like, you know, uh, I'm an immigrant, by the way, so, you know, I have to say America is the greatest uh, country in the history of the world, as sort of like, you know, uh, some Fox News people would, would, would say that it's all about history. So I can see sort of like, you know, that even without God, that manifest destiny component, it becomes, of course, that's what it is. And even under Biden, in terms of, of under President Biden, in terms of the NASA's rhetoric, it is that why we are going to space that plays a role, because of course, who else is going to go to space, right? I mean, so that is in there. So can I ask, but, but it's interesting about the private um, sort of like, you know, um, folks, uh, private uh, entrepreneurs using that language. So how do they use it? And is there a difference between the way they use it and the government? Yeah, they've got a much a, a much slicker language. Um, I don't think it's any less religiously infused, um, but it does seem to be less specifically, um, if we can call it like Judeo Christian. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a it's been traditionally the language of manifest destiny is a Christian imperialism um, that deliberately tries to claim the inheritance of Israel. So that's that's why I'm calling it Judeo Christian. Um, but again, you know, I think when Mike Pence says like God will be with us as we go to the heavens, I don't think that a ton of the electorate. I mean, maybe maybe a particular right wing part of the evangelical community is like, oh yes, God is gonna. But most people see that as a rhetorical move, and they don't feel particularly stirred by it. none of my students is like, oh, God will go with us. Fantastic. Well, like, not a single one. Right. Um, but a lot of my students will listen to Elon Musk say, hey, um, disaster is coming for this planet. This planet's about to be extinguished. Life on this planet, particularly human life on this planet will be extinguished. We got to find another place to go. The salvation of humanity depends upon me, Elon Musk saving you, bringing you to Mars. Um, and that uh, that language of, you know, coming disaster, the, this world is coming to an end. Um, there is a new world, a better world out there. You haven't seen it, but trust me, it's going to be great. Um, that language of disaster and salvation is a classically uh, sort of messianic move. Messiahs, um, charismatic preachers say this all the time. It's sort of emptied of its specific religious content, and it's sort of updated for this um, new kind of secular scientific crowd. Um, and I think that that is a much more compelling uh, um, set of rhetorical tools at this point than the, you know, God's going to be with us language. Okay, so so two things, you guys. I mean, I, I get what you're saying, and, um, and, and I should mention that uh, we already chatted uh, separately when you came here for to give a talk at Mount Holyoke College. So we had a conversation about Musk uh, in, in that sense as well. So, I mean, setting aside Musk, um, because I think he is the most important in some sense for the space rhetoric, uh, but I also see him as a particular, he's a different breed to a certain, he's a provocateur also, and, and sort of like, you know, I mean, of course, with Twitter and other things. Um, but if I can push you back a little, not on Musk's language, but on, and this is something that uh, pro space exploration people argue, and uh, and that is, but to a certain degree, that is true as well, meaning to say that 
life has gone extinct over multiple times um, on Earth. And climate change, of course, is taking place. So without taking the extreme either or case, like, you know, that, okay, well, this argument that why don't we fix problems here first before we go to space? I mean, that, that to me, that doesn't make much sense. But the argument that on Earth, we've had extinctions in the past, and there are going to be potential extinctions in the future. So in that sense, that narrative is not necessarily, I, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking in terms of the motivational factors, right? I mean, so so I can imagine, yes, for somebody like Musk, and he does use a quite negative sort of like, I am your savior. I mean, he literally, I mean, he talks about that. So that I can get sort of like the uh, messianic sort of like you know, context. But what about this argument that it is almost, I mean, you can make potentially make an ethical argument that if you think life is precious or humans, human life is precious, then going to space would actually be uh, an imperative because extinctions happen. So how do you see the two or, or do you see the difference or you think ultimately they both merge together? I do. Um, I do see the difference. I think it is hard to set aside Musk. I, I, I will do it. I'll do it in a minute. <laughs> but I think it's hard to set aside Musk. Um, because he has made himself and SpaceX totally integral to the U.S. space program. Um, the at, at, at this point, it is not; it will not be possible for NASA to accomplish its contemporary goals without SpaceX and without Elon Musk. So, it's increasingly hard to set him aside. But, but that having been said, yes, if we want to set rhetorically aside Elon Musk. <laughs> Um, the thing that I do think is is uh, the thing that I think is troubling. I'm going to hang on to him for one more minute before I set him aside. The thing I think is troubling about the Musk argument is that it does set up an either or between either we go the way of the dinosaurs or we nuke Mars with 10,000 nuclear warheads. Right? Those are these are your options. Right. Um, so storm the cosmos, destroy everything in your path for the sake of a few very wealthy people who are able to uh to to, to make it um or die on earth like the dinosaurs those are those are your options and that zero sum game seems to me to be um dangerous really dangerous um so that and it and it and it does um there are a number of it, another reason it's hard to set aside elon musk is that there are so many musk defenders who the moment you criticize the plan will say, well, what do you hate humanity? Are you a, you know, are you genocidal? I'm sorry, are you right? Okay. And, so and, that... if, I, and if I can say, uh, as sort of like as an astronomer and, and a lot of other people, planetary folks who have talked about it, that not only that it's a crazy plan in terms of that you don't just nuke a place uh, like Mars, but also it's not going to work. I mean, so so like, you know, scientifically, that is not the best way to actually make uh, Mars habitable. So. I just want to clarify, but but you are absolutely right. Like, you know, that if you do criticize it, there are muskans or whatever, like, you know, you get that rhetoric in the back. Yeah. Yeah. So he's hard to set aside, but now I'm setting him aside. And now the question is, is there some kind of sensible ethical argument in there? I think this is the question you were asking. Yeah. Um, I want to go to the sort of minor premise of the way that you set up the argument, which is um, if we agree that life is worth saving or that human life is worth saving or something like that, right? I think that's the that's the crux there. And that's what's really difficult to talk about because the minute you start talking about it, people accuse you of genocide. Um, but it doesn't seem to me to be a um, a given that humanity, if insofar as we are, uh, we can talk about humanity, Humanity as a whole species it doesn't seem to be a given that humanity has um, any more right to escape mass extinction than di than the dinosaurs, for example. I mean, what is it? I think we at least have to ask what it is that makes it particularly important that humans escape the fate of every other species on this planet, which is to say, eventual extinction. Everything else eventually goes. Why do we deserve special treatment? Okay. I think. To the extent that we think, feel like instinctively that we do deserve special treatment, that we are more important than every other species on the planet, this is partly a religious inheritance. This is partly the inheritance of a particular set of traditions that tell us that humans are one, 
different from every other species on earth to unrelated to every other species on earth, right? For a lot of indigenous communities, for example, there are like plant and animal lives to, to which humans are completely related by virtue of kinship. Um, and three, more important than everything else on the earth. Now this may in fact be true, but I do think it's an assumption, and I do think that we have to we have to ask where it comes from, and then and then justify it and make that justification. Um, the reason is it is it do we deserve to live just because we have the idea right that we can like see the extinction coming, and therefore and you know if the dinosaurs could have run off the planet, would they have? And in that case, is it just our our capacity to do it that allows us to um, to to uh, sort of form an escape? escape plan, an escape hatch or something like that. Um, whatever the answer is to these sets, these very difficult sets of questions, um, I do not think we are, we have the liberty, we are at liberty to save ourselves at the expense of everybody else on the planet, which is to say the kind of um, sort of techno prophecy that says it is our obligation now to abandon earth um, and perhaps even to intensify the climate crisis in order to escape it so that humanity can escape it. That seems to me to be an ethical non-starter completely. So um, I don't think that it's um, an ethical given that humanity should survive at all costs, but that probably makes me a very unpopular person. Yeah, oh, well, I mean, I mean that I don't know. I mean, I mean, that's an interesting context. Uh, and, and but, but if I can say, but in some sense, if you if we go the other way, like, you know, that, well, that's what the fate is. I mean, wouldn't that take you into fatalist viewpoint, which can also be religious? Like, you know, that, well, that is what is written to a certain degree. Uh, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, in some sense, I mean, any argument, uh, I mean, either way, it, it could be framed as a religious argument because, I mean, religions have a full spectrum of uh, ideals as well. Look, I'm a religion person. I see religion yeah. everywhere. Wherever, wherever you run, you're getting into religion. Right. I mean, the question, is, and you're, which is to say you're getting into myths, you're getting into stories, you're getting into prophecies, you're getting into promises, right. you're getting into origin stories. You're getting, um, for me, the question is not so much, which is um, how do you get out of religion? Because I don't think you do. Because um, we're formed by these stories. Um, the question also isn't, which is the correct religion, because, you know, good luck with that. Um, the question is, which of these stories um, do we want to live with? Which of these stories present us with values that we feel good embodying and that we feel right and that that um, encourage um, the kind of behavior that we want to enact? And then the question is, what kind of behavior do we want to enact? Right? Is it salvation of humanity at all costs? Is it a kind of mutual stewardship to the best of our abilities between humanity and other creatures that exist? Right. Um, it, but I think if we if we pretend that these motivations are entirely secular, um, we miss the extent to which there are other there are other, other alternatives. There are other ways to live. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I think that's where we are headed, I mean, to a certain degree in terms of, I mean, one of the goals for this series is also is to look at, well, what would responsible exploration or human settlement would look like, right? And and that includes, implicitly, that includes this question, well, like, you know, well, maybe, and some people have argued uh, that responsible human space exploration looks like no exploration, right? Like, you know, and some people have argued, well, I mean, like, you know, it, it's not a given, no, what we shouldn't do. Uh, but on the other hand, I mean, I think then there are all these other messy questions where uh, what, what you just listed as well, how do we think about, because there is an expense question as well, that even if we say, okay, we are going to do that, but it comes at what expense does it come at? And how do we think of that ethically? So, uh, before we get to that, and maybe we can do a bridge to that, because I do want to talk about you spend some time in the book about whose space is it, and uh, and I think that's that's a really, I mean I think that's really integral to some of the conversation that we've been having, including from the frontier language to manifest destiny to how we think about the future. But I do want to get back to Disney. Uh, okay. You know, and <laughs> it's always it's always a good sort of like you know uh, secretary like no hey but what about Disney okay so uh, so Barnabas and Brown there was a connection with Disney which I found fascinating uh, can you elaborate on that of why Disney would be part of this 
Yeah, this is fab fabulous. Um, so I owe this whole story to my colleague, our colleague, colleague Catherine Newell, um, who unearthed it in this wonderful uh, book about the um, the sort of golden space age. Um, so here's how it goes. Uh, Walt Disney is looking to break ground in Anaheim, California on Disneyland. Um, and he's got it all planned out. It's going to be uh, four different places that there's going to be a main street that goes sort of this way you're gonna you're gonna come through main street or main street no main street goes this way and then there's like a bisecting avenue that goes this way um and uh fantasy land is in front of you and adventure land where you can like have all sorts of orientalist adventures as sort of off to the side um and then frontier land is to the left and in frontier land you get to be at, ride in mine trains and wear coonskin caps and pretend that you're davy crockett and then directly opposite frontier land he wanted to have his last land with which is going to be Tomorrowland, um, the land of the future. So the, there's there's the pa the American past, and then there's the American future. And it's the early 50s. Um, and he's trying to think like, okay, so what's the American future going to look like? Like, what what what, what do I do? What, 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 what kind of model do I use? And one of his animators dropped on his lap this copy of Collier's magazine from 1953. The lead article was written by Werner von Braun, and it was a bunch of other articles by his colleagues, um, arguing that the U.S. had to develop a space program. Um, and he looks at it and he's like, this is it, right? And in fact, Werner von Braun's uh, article there was called Crossing the Last Frontier. That's the the place that I, I've first okay. seen space sort of being encoded as the last frontier, right? taking over that California mantle. Um, uh, and von Braun says to his animators, like, I don't care, blank check, blank check, get these guys. I want these guys in here right now, spend whatever you have to spend. Um, and so uh, von Braun comes to Disney and he's like, this is it, this is my rocket. This is what it's gonna look like. And the future is gonna be in outer space. And we're going to, It's it, this is the US imperative. The US has to go up there and like bring 1950s living rooms with televisions and sofas and things into outer space. We're going to live on the moon. We're going to live on Mars. We might live on Venus. I don't know. Is it too hot? We're not quite sure yet. It might be a little hot. Um, we're going to live on the moon. We're going to live on Mars. We're going to live eventually on asteroids, all sorts of other places. Um, and Disney's like, that's it. This is the vision of the future that I want. Um, Disney uh, looks at Von Braun, says, uh, this, <laughs> this looks fantastic, except your rocket is ugly. Um, could you please redesign it because it's really disgusting? Um, uh, he, along with the animators, actually sort of revamps the aesthetics of the rockets, and then that rocket becomes the prototype for the Saturn rockets for the Apollo missions. I mean, it's absolutely amazing, and it also becomes the prototype, the thing that like stands and anchors um, Tomorrowland uh, in Disney World. So the idea is that um, you can walk if you want to walk across that that kind of horizontal plane from Frontierland all the way into Tomorrowland, and you can like follow the American path from its past to its future. And the idea is that, again, that the, the future is inheriting this logic of the frontier. And and you had uh, mentioned uh, in the book like, you know, that one of Von Braun also became an evangelical Christian, which he was yeah, yeah, he before. And yeah, so yeah. that got sort of like the religious angle sort of like, you know, I mean, that animated him and in some sense his views in terms of how the, front, the final frontier should be or the last, the next frontier. Yeah, he he actually was excited about evangelizing aliens. Um, that it was uh, America's mission to you know Christianize the universe. Um, in addition to all of those things, um, but really, you know, honestly, the 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 um, the place he got this idea was was Adolf Hitler, who <laughs> had imported the idea of so. I mean, it's such a mess. It's right. Manifest destiny gets imported into Third Reich. Germany as the doctrine of Lebensraum, which is the idea that the German people need more space in which to live. Um, so Hitler said, you know, we're going to invade Poland because we need more space. We got to We got to expand um, and we'll treat the native Polish people, he says, as redskins. So he's using uh -huh. U.S. context to justify the conquest of Poland. He's got this doctrine of Lebensraum, which he then, you know, teaches to all his foot soldiers. And then von Braun sort of re-Americanizes Lebensraum into a, a sort of vertical manifest destiny, infuses it with some spirit of newly found evangelical Christianity, um, works with Walt Disney, and then we've got Disneyland and the Apollo missions. This, is, this is crazy. And, uh, and uh, not to mention, I mean, social Darwinism or eugenics also came from the US to uh, Germany uh, in some sense. So yeah, so it all gets actually really Messed up. So let's uh, 
talk about uh, the, whose space is it uh, in the sense that this is, I think, and in this series, uh, uh, we have also, we're going to talk to uh, space lawyers, for example, because outer space treaty, which governs right now, at least everything, um, it's 1967. That's before the first uh, human landing on the moon. And we are going back and, and, and I'm trying to focus on again, just on the moon, because in some sense, that's where the precedence is going to get set. Like Mars is a little bit far off, but I think whatever happens on Mars, they are going to look back and say, well, here is what happened on the moon. And so I think moon is a really crucial place. And you spend quite a bit of time uh, addressing and thinking about how to deal with this issue. Uh, and, and again, so if I can bifurcate this, one is, okay, so uh, of course, one option is not to go, right? I mean, but, but I think that genie is probably out of the bottle and like you know we are going to go and now the question is and your book is a critique uh of the corporate um involvement in there and as you mentioned musk is hard to separate because he is part and parcel of nasa's plans uh artemis plans and so on and so forth so is jeff bezos in fact jeff bezos is more involved with the moon or is going to be more involved with the moon so how do you think about this issue in terms of not the ownership, because if I say the word ownership, it already uh, frames the conversation in a different way. But how do we think about who, where, whose space belongs to whom, or the moon belongs to whom? It's a mess. It's a mess, because as you know better than I do, because the Outer Space Treaty um, was hammered out um, just after the formation of the United Nations in the wake of two disastrous world wars that almost completely annihilated a good part of the planet. Um, and of course, those two world wars were the product of Europe's colonial adventures during the 18th and 19th centuries. I mean, we're stretching back to the 15th century, but really that sort of came to a fever pitch um, in the 19th century and the, or early 20th century. Um, so it, my sort of pet reading of the Outer Space Treaty is that the United Nations was saying, okay, let's not do this again. Let's not do this again. But that was a mess. We, the way that we did, the way that we colonized this planet um, was bad, not for the planet. I don't think most people were, care, were like cared about the planet um, and not particularly for the poor of the earth or for the colonized. It was bad for the colonizers. Like it was bad for Europe. Europe almost destroyed itself, right? So um, I don't, I, I see them as saying, can, can we not, can we not do this the same way? Um, uh, outer space is the common heritage, they say, of all mankind. You can ignore the gendered language for a moment. It's the common heritage of all mankind. Therefore, no nation can own a planetary body or a part of a planetary body. Um, the problem that we're having now is that the US in particular, feeling sort of stifled by this uh, treaty to which they agreed, has created all of these sort of sneaky ways to run around that uh, that set of uh, that set of agreements in the Outer Space Treaty, um, and has declared, for example, that yeah, although you can't own a planet or part of a planet, you can own the stuff in a planet. Um, so that if you manage to, if you if you want some lunar regolith, you can gather up some lunar regolith and own it and sell it to somebody who can buy it. And so what so talking about precedent, um, what NASA has just done is that it's just paid a private corporation like a dollar to gather some lunar regolith, deposit it from one place to another, consider it delivered um, in order to establish the precedent um, and to argue that, yes, it is possible to own the stuff in the planetary body without owning the planetary body. Now, the question, two questions emerge for me. One is, What's the difference between the stuff in a planetary body and the planetary body? What of what is a planetary body composed other than the stuff in the planetary body? That's one. The second is even if you can make that distinction, okay, I don't own this space, but I own the stuff inside it. In order to set up a mine so that you can get that water or you can get that whatever you think is under there, uranium three, whatever, right? You need to establish some boundaries around your mine 
right? And if you're an American outfit, you're not just going to like let a Chinese outfit in there to like come get some water too. So you're going to protect it. You're going to establish borders there. You're going to call in the Space Force and say, Space Force, please. And then at that point, once you've got a cordoned off area that's militarized, what is the difference practically between claiming that for the use of mining and claiming it as property. It's not clear to me. And then, of course, the third problem is that a lot of these mining outfits are private corporations to which the Outer Space Treaty doesn't apply in the first place because it doesn't say that a corporation can't own the planetary body. It just says that a nation can't own it. So it's a big mess. It's a big mess. I don't know. This is that... that was that the you were not looking for that answer? You weren't looking. For no, that I'm, I mean I think uh, I think that, uh, now that you have set up the mess now, uh, now I'm looking for solutions. Yeah, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, but but I mean I think no, I, I think that I mean you have laid out uh, perfectly. That is precisely the kind of questions that come in, and so well, from the U.S. side, there is this Artemis Accord, uh, which they say, okay, well, so that is a way of. Um, solving some of these things, and and they are updating the out, the outer space treaty uh, to the modern times, and so on and so forth. And it it does use, and so this is, I mean, I think where your work is uh, is actually really uh, useful because they do use a lot of the times this lofty language. So in Artemis Accord, also, I mean, you are right now pointing to the messiness or what's going to happen, for example, if conflict arises, whereas. If you listen to the or the, the written rhetoric of it, that aspect is given to the responsible parties. People will act responsibly, but the rest of it is actually given in a much more glowing and uh, almost utopian uh, language. Like, you know, that, oh, this is all everybody's working together well and, and nice and things like that. But what about the f a more broader question in terms of? who gets to even decide these questions, right? So even if we think about, well, okay, well, here is a, here is Artemis Accord or here is whatever Accord or, or something like that. And who gets to decide what's going to be or what, what framework are we going to work on the moon? So meaning to say, who are the parties that are on the table talking about these mm -hmm. conversations? Right. So this is this is the problem that, you know, as multilateral as the Artemis Accords may be, they are limited to the, what, 12 signatory nations um, that the U.S. considers to I be think, its most. I think they've gotten up to 20 now or something like that. We've yeah. gotten up to 20. OK. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who's not there is China and Russia, for example, right. who are like pretty important space actors. So right. ensuring the peace between U.S. space actors, Canadian space actors and Italian space actors isn't doing a ton. Right. right? So you might be able to establish that protocol among your allies. Um, but it seems to me that the Artemis Accords are there for the purpose of making a big like runaround um, around the UN for saying, oh, well, all right, fine. If you're not going to move quick enough, um, we're going to establish our own multilateral agreements. And again, th th there are a couple of ob objections you could raise, one of which is that you shouldn't run around the UN. Um, the other of which is that you're still setting yourself up against these two other major space actors. Um, so if the US has all of these allies, but we're still um, sort of posed contrapuntally against the US and uh, China and Russia, it's not clear to me that that's preventing something like space war, for example. Um, who gets to make these arrangements? Look, if you read the um, the, the, like the minutes of the, the body of the UN that's, the, that's uh, charged with uh, working out sort of outer space policies, every couple of years when they meet, um, a number of different governments are going to say the Americans are, are flagrantly in violation of the Outer Space Treaty. Right. Um, and as one of, I don't know if you're going to have um, Timmy Biaganaba, who's a wonderful space lawyer on, on the program, um, but what she'll say is, you know, so what happens if the government of Botswana says, we object, the U.S. is misbehaving? Well, what happens is that it gets recorded dutifully in the minutes that the government of Botswana objects. But Botswana does not have a space program, right? Um, and even though, you know, an entire African continent is getting together its own um space agency, right? Um, it does not have the wherewithal to oppose the signatories of the Artemis nations. So these these same um 
power imbalances um, that have been uh, that, that that again, I th I think the uh, initial outer space treaty was trying to con was trying to counteract um, the imbalance between spacefaring nations and non spacefaring nations um, between outlandishly spacefaring nations, China, Russia, the U.S., and sort of mildly spacefaring nations, Australia, India, right. Um, those uh, those are those are I think even being intensified, um, it, 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 which seems to me a flagrant violation of the the spirit of what 1967 was trying to do. So uh, and, and I, I like your uh, sort of like you know uh, description of sort of like you know mild space so mild uh, spacefaring nations and sort of like extreme. Um, okay, so how how about if we if you say okay you have written a book on that you've been thinking about it you have been thinking about it from the larger context of um culture religion mythology which are all actually deeply ingrained in how we think about space uh i started this conversation with star trek of course like you know an idealized utopian version at least the original version in there how would you what if if you were given the rein, sort of like you know that okay well here is how here is a way of setting up um a table or 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 setting up a framework how would you set up a framework or how would you think about a framework for again for the settlements on the moon what would you bring in and what you would think sort of like hey here are things that we really need to bring in which are not part of the conversation and this would be a nice balance on how to think about it Okay, so you're talking like real politic here. You're talking like within within the the, the situation that we have. Right? Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, I mean, I, I'm just saying like, no. Okay, so here's the situation we have, uh, and you are given the opportunity, sort of like you know, to weigh in, right. like how should we modify it? What should we do now in order to think about settlements on the moon? Okay, because because so I'm going to set aside for a moment my like you know, queer Afro-futurist, indigenous futurist, liberationist paradigm, like that, like that, that, that let's set us that aside for a moment. <laughs> we, can, we can come back to it. I mean, I mean, I, th I don't think we should have completely excluded, but yes, let's, let's set aside um, right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, so uh, the U.S., um, as you may know, um, is, uh, the, the Na NASA is completely barred from even having a cup of coffee with the Chinese space agency. Um, there is no, there is a an embargo on working in any way, shape, or form with China. Um, I think this is disastrous. I think this needs to be reconsidered immediately. And I think you're right to say that there isn't a zero sum game between what we do on Earth and what we do in space. So like, like fix Earth's problems first and then go to space. One problem we have to fix first, I think, is communication between the U.S. and China. Um, and it would be a lot easier to fix that on the ground than it would be to fix it on the moon. It seems to me. Um, we have models of international collaboration in outer space. It's called the International Space Station. I think the International Space Station could be a great model for how to establish working conditions on the moon. Um, and you know, there we managed to be able to get along with Russia. Um, yeah. We need we need to figure out how to how to bring China into the mix. Every couple of years, Russia and China together bring some kind of proposal before the before the UN, and the US rejects it because it's coming from Russia and China, whom they say couldn't possibly have any. Um, decent motivations in bringing these this kind of uh, legislation before the UN. That's got I. We got to cut it out. We got to cut it. I, I don't. I don't know how else to say it. Um, there, there, there needs to be a lifting of that embargo to working with uh, with uh, Chinese scientists and astronauts and um, physicists and even the space agency um, in order to get anything done there. So yeah, I think that the like the lowest stakes model here, the like the easiest one to aspire to, would be the International Space Station. We've got it. We've done it. We can do it again. Uh, and I think I think that's a that's a, a really a good point because even after the Ukraine war started, I mean the International Space Station, I, I, even right now, it's actually that is still to a certain degree working. And who knows what's going to happen in the future? But that conversation has stayed the same. And and to a certain degree, in the Cold War model as well, the threat of nuclear weapons was such that uh, people from both sides were still talking about it. At least some people. So I mean, I think that model is good. Um, I want to go back to your idealized version as well, and I want to bridge that by asking, uh, I mean, even when we talk about US, China, Russia, India, Australia, and those things, I mean, I'm originally from Pakistan, so I'm Pakistan 
used to, I mean, our space agency was a long time ago, but it's not, not in the, even in the mild space exploration category. And certainly a lot of these decisions are going to be made about, for example, um, the moon and things like that in the next 10 years or so. And those are going to be made as even the table that you have laid as just a handful of countries, right? So, and that is to not even bring up the indigenous groups and others who have a different formulation. Um, I mean, within the religious context as well, a lot of these conversations, especially from the Western side or sort of like, you know, in that sense, and again, I, I would use it in quotes, uh, Judeo-Christian or Islamic context, which is a particular way of having a relationship with nature. But then, uh, of course, you have indigenous groups and 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 communist groups. And, and that sort of like, you know, that is also another formulation. How do you think sort of like, you know, they come into play? And then maybe we can go into your idealized version in which you were saying, OK, Afrofuturism and things like that, that also play a role. But is there a space even from the real politics, sort of like, you know, in the practical aspects that there may have, that there may be a space, no pun intended, to have their voices in this conversation? Yeah, um, I worry about this. I worry that um, representational politicking has um, taken over to such an extent that it seems as though, say, NASA has done its job when it's finally got a woman and a black man on the Artemis II crew, right? Um, so I, I, it, it seems to me that it, in real political terms, um, representation is um, seems to be carrying the load of um, transforming and awakening the awakening the the space program, um, and it seems to me that if you take a mission that's been established on you know a, a paradigm of um, scientific Western dominance that it inherited, frankly, from Christian imperialism. If you take that paradigm and then you fill it with a couple of, you know, black and brown faces, um, you haven't really changed the paradigm at all. Um, so there is a there was a white paper that went out um, for NASA's last dec decadal survey um, from a number of your colleagues in um, astronomy and astrophysics, um, some planetary scientists, um, and some cultural theorists uh, who wrote in to say to NASA, um, look, we are embarking on this new mammoth stage of space exploration by means of Artemis. Um, it seems to us to be the sort of minimal ethical requirement to um, inform the public of what we're up to and then uh, get what they call community feedback. Right. Um, particularly, they said, from uh, Black and Indigenous uh, communities that may have different ideas about what it's permissible to do in space or what it's uh, what it's uh, what what's what's sort of ideal um, to, to uh, ideal sp behavior in outer space. Um, I haven't heard any response from. NASA, certainly. It, it's been ridiculed by some real sort of fervent space colonizers, um, but no actual response. NASA is very good at setting up these little, you know, cute little animations um, to put up on their website so that we can see like how we're going to land and then where we're, where we're going to find the water and then we're going to go to Mars. And um, but I don't think they're particularly good at receiving what these authors are calling uh, community feedback. You know, what if the moon is sacred to your community? What if the moon is secret to your community? Um, can it then be mined or ought it to be mined? Um, what should we be preserving from the perspective of different um, folks on, on earth who might have different kinds of relationships to the moon than just a strictly instrumental one? Um, I don't know that there's a mechanism for that kind of input. Um, and and again, what I, what I get upset about with this um, uh, the kind of like inclusivity movement is that it seems as though NASA has done its due diligence by including folks who are non-white in their missions. But I, I don't know that they've included voices that are non-white in their sort of planning, <laughs> especially not, yeah. right? So that, that's the, that's the, yeah. that's the. And I think uh, there are lessons to be learned uh, uh, from observatories on controversial sites. And uh, I mean, I've followed quite a bit. I've used telescopes over there in Hawaii as well. And there was a worst case previously in Arizona that was in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, where uh, you might be uh, you you may be familiar with that or you might find it interesting because the telescope project was called. This was 1992 when it was supposed to be launched. It was called Project Columbus, and it was part of the Vatican Observatory. So 
bad name, bad choice, but <laughs> all of that stuff. Um, and Hawaii, certainly, uh, there are these controversies again. So that's uh, this notion. I think that's a really good point about the representation bit, because in some sense, the uh, the box was checked in terms of Hawaiian representation, but that didn't mean that Hawaiian voices were being heard. And that actually is the one that led eventually to mass protests against uh, the 30 meter telescope. And so uh, I think, I think, the, uh, but, but I'm just thinking, yeah. And I think that, I think this is where it's going to get really tricky. And in some sense, that's where public pressure comes in. I mean, I mean, I, I, I mean, I think space enthusiasts, I mean, like, you know, and I can sp count myself in it. I mean, I think it is our responsibility to bring, to, uh, to have those voices, to push for those voices as well, as broadly as possible, because otherwise it gets too easy to dismiss that, well, they are anti-space. Right? I mean, I think the people who can bring those in and NASA has all of these issues because what they can and cannot say and so on and so forth. But I think it's the surrounding, uh, I mean, NASA's PR machine is pretty good. And that's, I mean, you talked about all these slick videos. Well, I mean, so I think it's the, if there is pressure to include that and same thing goes with inclusion of women and, uh, and African-American and so on and so forth. It is because of that. I mean, the 60s right. mission was very white and very male. <laughs> you know, so I mean, it changed, and and so, but have, but rather than just a symbolic change, it needs to be structural, right? Yeah. And I mean, what what would it look like if a bunch of Trekkie geeks yeah. got behind the Prime Directive and were like, "No, seriously, take it seriously. I mean it, NASA, take it seriously. Why don't we treat the moon the way? What what about just considering treating the moon the way that we would treat a, what what's now a state park or a national forest?" We know how to do this. We know how to do as little harm as possible. Um, the problem is that the prime directive, for example, stands at total odds with profiteering from the cosmos. <laughs> you can, it doesn't stand at odds with exploration. It doesn't even necessarily stand at odds with settlement of some kind of gentle kind, but it certainly stands at odds with um, you know, ransacking planetary bodies for everything they're worth. So um, I don't know. I would love that. I'd love a little <laughs> convention. Uh, 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 I, I, I love the prime directive thing. And I think that's that's the way of sort of like, you know, bringing in sort of like, you know, I think that's a that's a potent weapon in, in, in some sense, because prime directive is 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 very ideal. So actually, can I uh, we're getting towards the end, but uh, can I ask this question? I mean, I can, do you think um, it's the corporatized are these private corporations? Do you think they are the undergird that that's the real problem? Uh, or is it the way that governments are dealing with this in terms of space exploration? Uh, or maybe the combination because colonialism has been uh, tied together? How do you see that? So colonialism, as you know, has always depended upon private capital. Is all I mean terrestrial colonialism. We and and then the you know the space industry has always relied on Boeing on right. Um, so there's there's always been, there's sort of cooperation between nation states and corporate interest all the way down. Um, would that it weren't the case that 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 I, I think that though that there has been an intensification of that problem um, since 2011 when Obama turned over a major part of the space sector to the to the to the private sector when he said look it, it is time to um, give these contracts to private actors we can't be in charge of this anymore um, the problem then is that it's no longer the corporations who are working for the nation states nation states are already a mess but anyway yeah. it's no longer the corporations who are working for the nation states now the Nation states need to kind of contort their space programs to fit the interests of capital. Um, and the interests of capital are always going to be to maximize profit at all expense. Um, there is no there is no rosier goal than that. That's it. That's the one. Um, so, yeah, I do think that actually corporations are the problem. And corporations, in some sense, can work both ways, because on the one hand, they do get subsidies from the government and contracts from the government. But on the other hand, they can say, wait a minute, but we are not a nation, so we are not bound by this thing, especially because there are multi-country I mean they're not related to just one country as well so they, they kind of pay. and by the way as from coming from South Asia we are very familiar with the British East India Company right. which sort of like you know which was um, responsible yeah. for that yeah. so towards the end uh, you actually talk uh, about 
science, you bring in science fiction. We've been talking about Prime Directive. We've been talking about Star Trek. And um, and I was really struck by one of my favorite stories is by Ursula Le Guin, um, the ones who walk away from Amalas. And, uh, uh, and, but you mentioned a story which is inspired by that and you connect it to thinking about space. So can you put those two together? Yeah. So the story, the ones who walk away from Omalas, is a it's a, a utopian dystopian story um, about a perfect community where everybody is happy, everybody is fed, everybody is free. It's you know multiracial, multi aged, just just an absolutely gleaming, joyful community um, whose um, magnificent well being. Uh, is all dependent on the suffering of one child in a basement closet um, who is denied access to anything but the most meager amounts of food and water, um, who is tortured, who's beaten. And that child's suffering um, is understood to be the mechanism that sustains the sort of blissful happiness of the rest of the society. Um, and Le Guin uh, says, you know, look, nobody feels good about it. Everybody knows that this child is miserable. Um, but they also know that if this child were not to be miserable, their whole, the fabric of their entire society would fall apart. Um, so, you know, eh. um, and then she ends the story by saying, you know, there are some who come to this awakening to understand that this is what their society is predicated on and who walk away. Um, and they walk away toward a land, Le Guin says, that I can't even imagine. I don't even know where they're going um, but they seem to know where where they are going right as if to say like this even the suffering of this child is not worth happiness so i will give up my happiness i will leave um because i can't put, be part of this system anymore um the afrofuturist author nk jemison um who's utterly indebted to ursula Le Guin and loves her work um i think is troubled <laughs> by that child i mean right you so you walk away okay well done you've walked away but you haven't taken the child the child's still there sustaining that you know murderous um the murderous happiness of of that culture um what about the child so rather than the ones who walk away from omelas she writes a story called the ones who stay and fight and there um we have uh we have a society that is also um that is predicated she says on the principle um that its citizens will care for one another that's the principle. It's a, a city of people who care for for one another, which is just so. I mean, it's it's sort of heartbreaking in its simplicity. Right? What would it mean to create a city of people who cared for one another? Um, well, what it would mean for Jemison is that everybody has a house and everybody has a place to sleep and everybody has enough food and everybody has more than enough food and there are even festivals and there and everybody can participate in the festivals and right. Um, and is there a hitch? Yeah, of course there's a hitch. The hitch is that the inhabitants of the city cannot be exposed to the idea from our society, that some people are worth more than other people, that there are some people who are more important than other people. Um, so when that idea seems to, like, cause you get transmissions like radio transmissions or TV transmissions from, from our, our society, when that idea finds a way to worm its way into the society, um, that person has to be either deprogrammed or killed because that that idea can't, can't stay. So there's the hitch. The hitch is that there's not like a total diversity of opinion here because um, that one idea um, that some people are more important than others will bring the whole thing um, crumbling down. Um, so here, I think Jemison um, isn't, is, is, it gives us the most like clear eyed vision of um, an ideal society while still saying like, yeah, I understand. I understand that it can't be flawless. It can't be perfect. Um, but like, this is the best I can do. Um, and I think that what's so um, marvelous about science fiction and speculative fiction is that it is not beholden to real politic. It doesn't say like, all right, well, we got Russia, we got China, we got India, what are we going to do? Um, it starts from the beginning and it says like, let's build from scratch a society based on the principle that people care for one another and that everybody's worth something. You know, where can we go? Um, and I think that you can get farther, you can get farther than you can um, with beginning with what seems possible, right? It pushes the boundaries of what's possible. Well, that's great. That's a great place to end, but I'm going to ask you one last question. But I think, <laughs> I think this is actually perfect because... So what, I mean, I think this is actually such a, uh, I mean, a, a wonderful point, like, you know, that where do you start, right? So if you start with real, like, you know, I mean, yeah, I mean, like, you know, then where do you end up versus that you create sort of like, you know, some sort of uh, idealized version to behold to and then go in a particular direction. How do you see the, and this is a 
I mean, really personal question. How do you see uh, the future of humans in space? Or how, uh, I mean, it's again, we are looking at the 10 years where there will be humans on the moon, probably living over there. China is going to be there. US. How do you see this play out? I mean, do you see that as potentially a breakthrough where there could be a hopefulness? Or do you see sort of like the, and some of the more unfortunate trends that are taking place on Earth, and they get actually exacerbated, multiplied uh, because of technological differences and economic aspects associated with that. How do you see that? Okay, um, I, I see it very clearly going both ways, um, and I see it very clearly going either way um, by means of the category of space garbage. I think space garbage can send us into either of these directions. Um, you know, as as you know, there are so many pieces of orbital degree, debris uh, traveling at ungodly paces um, that can be, um, you know, little nuts and bolts and screws that have break, broken off of things, dead satellites, right? Um, that can um, absolutely destroy, say, the International Space Station. That can destroy satellites. That can destroy, um, and. Uh, so it seems to me that like that the example of space garbage is an example of the way that ordinary earthly problems get amplified to sort of monstrous proportions in outer space. Um, somebody accidentally destroys somebody's satellite, somebody intentionally destroys somebody's satellite, that um, explosion goes on to destroy other things. Suddenly everybody's fighting everybody, everybody's space forces is ab ab obliterating everybody else. Right. Um, or space garbage becomes such a bad uh, problem that we can't even get to where we're going anymore because we're like sort of encased in in earth right so it it, it seems that it could uh, amplify every every possible um, problem um it is also possible that insofar as space garbage is a universal evil right that like it's bad for everybody it's just as bad for china as it is for the us as it is for russia as it is for india as it is for italy as it is for botswana um it could be that there could be some kind of sustained effort and insofar as nobody knows how to remove even a single piece of space garbage <laughs> um it could be that there could be some kind of not multilateral but like but just but translateral like everybody trying to figure out how on earth to deal how in space to deal with the problem of space garbage um that could actually demonstrate that it's possible for all of the space-bound earthlings out there um, to work together on a common problem. Um, and so, and and then to see perhaps like, oh, look at that. We were able to communicate about this shared disaster. Maybe we could communicate in similar ways about, you know, finding ways to. So anyway, I'm, my bets are on space garbage either way. I know, but, but you're not taking one, but you're not taking a hopeful sense. I'd be like, you know. Uh, of course uh, I'm not taking a hopeful, no, it's going to be worse. Of course it's going to be worse. Uh, it's going to be terrible. Ah, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's gonna. I think I. I, I don't. I, I think, but it. It. You know. I. I always hold out the hope that either by virtue of some awful shared disaster, or before we hit a shared disaster, um, we might find a different way to go um, because we can realize that we're all fighting uh, the. You know, the same problem, and we're all we. And we may, in fact, all have the same aspirations, which is to say, um, I don't know, a, a city where everybody cares about each other. Yeah, I think, um, uh, unfortunately, that's what I was also thinking when you were saying that, like, you know, that, yeah, I mean, uh, even on the moon, I mean, if, unfortunately, disasters are someplace where people, there's a jolt to the system and people may realize, you know, we really need to rethink that. Um, nuclear arms did that to a certain degree, um, although after dropping of two bombs, so that's not a good thing, um, but hopefully we do that. Well, thank you so much, uh, I'm Professor Ruben Sini. And again, uh, just as a reminder, book is Astrotopia, uh, The Dangerous Religion of uh, the Corporate Space Race. And it's a fascinating book. And uh, and again, we didn't even talk about Canaanites and sort of like, you know, Canaan and uh, and all of the other stuff, which is also uh, in the book, also a lot about indigenous religions and the, the way they look at uh, the relationship with space, but maybe at some other point. So uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate it, Salman. It was wonderful talking with you.